Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm based here in Liverpool um, on and off, uh, and I work for Kickstarter. Um, I started working for Kickstarter about three years ago, and I was our first international employee, so I always like make a joke that, that Liverpool was Kickstarter's like international headquarters for a long time. Uh, so yeah, very cool. Um, I want to start with uh, just a little story um, to compare these two products, and if some of you in this, the room know these products already, then uh, forgive me, but um, you know, I'm a cyclist, um, and these are two pretty cool cycling uh, lights. Um, they're both very similar. They, uh, the one on the left is called the Varia, the one on the right is called the laser light. And on the surface, these two lights have a lot in common. They're both kind of around 150 pounds. Uh, they both were made in the last few years. They have pretty nice design. They're technology driven. You can uh, buy them at, at places like Evan Cycle. But if you kind of dig in a little bit, you'll find that these two products represent like fundamentally different approaches to product design and development. Um, so to understand, we can dive in. You know, the left was made by a company called Garmin, which of course um, you've probably heard of them. They're a multi-billion-dollar company who make you know hundreds, if not thousands, of projects. Uh, and you know, some of them are, are successful. You know, they'll go on to be bestsellers. Some of them end up in the rubbish bin. Um, but every time they make a product, essentially they're taking a gamble on kind of what they think is going to work in the market. Uh, but the second one was started by was created by a small startup called Barrel um, and founded in London. Uh, so this is Emily Brooke, and um, Emily is yeah just kind of a an amazing woman. She um, came up with the idea for Laser Light when she was a young product design student at the University of Brighton. Um, and you know she had no experience launching a product before. She just had this idea. It was a, her thesis product, and yeah, she um, happened to be coming up and doing that uh, project at a time when Kickstarter was just starting to open in the UK. And so she came to Kickstarter and raised around just over fifty thousand pounds to put the the, the uh, laser light into production. So now you can see them. Has anyone seen them before? So you can see them all throughout London on the bike share programs uh, there. They're also in New York, they're in Glasgow, Montreal, all kind of all over the world. But they really exist because Emily had this kind of vision. And then she went out to a community um, you know, and really like asked for people to support her vision, which was really cool. So she really like kind of sidestepped the, the traditional way of bringing a product to market and made kind of forged a new path. So Emily represents this kind of awesome new way of bringing um, products to life uh, that has kind of emerged over the last decade or so. Um, to help explain this, I, I like to bring up this article um, in, from Domus Magazine called the uh, DC Generation, and it focuses on designers, and I know there's a difference between designers and makers, but I'm going to conflate them in this talk a little bit. Um, but it reminded us that the industrial design practice that emerged in the, in the 20th century was essentially like a business-to-business -business model. So if you were a designer, you would um, you know, provide a design to a manufacturer who would take care of sales and distribution um, and, you know, manufacturing. But now the form of, like, design practice and also, I think, maker practice that is emerging is more like a, a D to C or a designer to consumer um, kind of model. So designers becoming their own manufacturers, connecting directly with their communities. And there's a, a guy who's launched a number of uh, projects on Kickstarter called um, Creighton Berman. He also teaches design at the University of Chicago. And he calls this design entrepreneurship. Um, and yeah, maybe we could bend this a little bit to say maker entrepreneurship here. Um, and in comparison to conventional entrepreneurship where you know, a business will uh, sit in an office and come up with a business plan for a product and um, grow it aggressively, you know, lean on marketing, all these kinds of things, um, design entrepreneurship is based around this act of making. Uh, seeing what works, kind of growing things organically, and spending a little bit more time, you know, with uh, with like storytelling, kind of talking about your projects in the world. So it's this sort of bottom-up approach. And he argues that this is really made possible by uh, kind of a number of things, kind of a confluence of a few different things all at once. But um, you know, advances in manufacturing, you know, spaces like this, small-scale or localized manufacturing being available, allowing people to make smaller runs of projects, um, you know, and also prototyping, kind of. Um, uh, alongside that, um, and also just essentially new ways for designers to connect with audiences. So you know, even something as silly as like social media or like animated gifts or like cheaply available video has just made it possible to uh, you know to build sort of like a community around yourself as a designer or a maker. And of course, access to finance has completely changed, and that's really where uh, Kickstarter comes in. 
So um, here's the d design. Oh, this also doesn't really read very well here. But here are some of the designs of the, the early Kickstarter site. I always like to use, like, put these up just because I love thinking about like websites and where they came from and the kind of cultural moment they came from. Um, you could tell actually it was 2009 because on the left, Kickstarter had no e at the end. It was like Kickstarter with a you know like flicker, yeah. with a, with no er. Um, so that was kind of a trend at the time. Um, but Kickstarter essentially popularized this idea of crowdfunding. Um, this idea of putting an, putting an idea on the internet and going out to a community to, to ask for support for that vision to bring it to life. Um, and nine years ago, uh, in 2009, that feels like a very long time ago, in internet years. I mean, it really was a different time. It was the tail end of the Web 2.0 period. Um, yeah, where there were a number of new services that were kind of, yeah, trying to... In, uh, or they were kind of gro growing popularity off the back of the ubiquity of the internet and sort of the utopian possibility to connect people um, uh, internationally. So the idea, the original idea, was to move away from the sort of gatekeeper models of money and access, so whether that's venture capital or grant funders or whatever, to try and open up. Uh, um, yeah, and, and that was really kind of where it came from. Uh, of course, this, ca this continues to be a reasonably effective model for projects. Uh, this is what the Kickstarter website looks like now, very similar in many ways, but um, it has helped a lot of things come to life. So whether that's previously inaccessible technologies, like this one, the Wazer, it's a desktop water jet cutter. Um, you know, this is something that you, know, you would only see in a factory before, but um, they were able to come to Kickstarter uh, and uh, raise several million dollars to bring this thing to life. Um, but not only just things, it's also been used as a mechanism to open up technologies to new communities um, and generate action from them. So uh, in this case, a foldoscope, it's a paper uh, microscope with a $1 bill of materials. And the guy, uh, he wanted to essentially give everyone around the world a microscope and be able to have a microscope in your back pocket, much like you would have a pencil. Um, yeah, it came to Kickstarter to really to, like, spread this around and uh, raised you know, almost 400000 um, or like open source projects, like the Open Building Institute, who came to Kickstarter uh, to raise money to make their <coughs> open building system more widely replicable, and, but also invited other people um, to contribute not only funds, but also designs to their database and to build, on their, uh, to build their sort of own houses. Um, so across all categories, the impact of Kickstarter is pretty diverse. Um, you know, here are our stats. You can see that like even the world of like dance has seen over 10 million pledged directly to, you know, from backers to those creators. But you can roughly see two types of projects that, um, that are on Kickstarter. It's the more like, I guess, cultural projects, I'd say, and the more product-based products. Um, I have a specialism in design and technology, so the more product-type products on, or projects on Kickstarter. Um, these are our stats. And really, like, um, yeah, just thinking about the history of products on Kickstarter, products and crowdfunding, um, it really started with this product. It was called the, um, the Glyph. It was a, a little like tripod, like adapter for your, um, yeah, to, to, so you put your iPhone on a tripod. And so these guys came up with this idea, I think around 2011. They were like, yeah, the iPhone's a very powerful photography tool, but we can't use a tripod with it. Like, we just want to make this thing. And so they came out to Kickstarter and said, like, hey, we have a minimum order quantity that we need to meet. Um, you know, can you back to this project and we'll send you that, that um, product in return in sort of six months' time. And it really opened the floodgates for what it could mean to be uh, like a crowdfunded product and, and yeah, for, for this kind of model. So yeah, it's had a really big impact, I think, and I just want to say like why this model matters. Just a few things here. Um, reducing barriers and taking more risks. So this is a project called Elemental. Uh, the creator, Julie, she like wanted to make a line of um, female action figures that were like, yeah, just a, a more, more friendly, more like um, representative, I think, of, of kind of the hopes and dreams of young girls. And um, she got rejected time and time again by the toy industry. So she came to Kickstarter with this idea, made it a uh, success. Producing small runs of things. We were talking about small runs. Oscar Lemit made this um, project. He had this dream to make the f to make the first like um, completely accurate lunar glow. So the idea that we have like these you know the globes of Earth, but he he was really obsessed with the moon, and wanted to take the kind of open data from NASA to turn this into like a really detailed model of of the of the moon. Um, but he needed a minimum order quantity to do that, and so he came to Kickstarter to fund like the first three hundred. Also, like building a community around a project. Um, this is the Artathon. So these guys, Mike and Jacob, they wanted to, to build a new type of um, musical instrument that would allow you kind of more intuitive. It's a mini controller that allows you a more intuitive 
um, interface, so you can strum it or play it like a piano, all kinds of things. Um, but they wanted to build it not just on their own, but also with a community of musicians who would kind of experiment with the um, product as they go. And also, yeah, creative independence. There's a number of people who just like, you know, like this, these designers, Segway and Taylor, they've launched like eight projects on Kickstarter. They have a design studio, but they have a lot of projects that they, you know, that are not like client projects, and they just want to launch them. Um, and uh, yeah, just to, to, to get them out in the world and to have independence and not only rely on, on clients. So yeah, these are like yeah some of the reasons why you know Kickstarter, why why product designers, why makers use Kickstarter, and I think you know why it had, where and why it has had a, an impact. Um, there are challenges, of course, uh, to doing this model, and maybe we can get into it when we when we have a, a discussion. But you know, fulfillment is an issue. Like you know, if you if you've never made a product before, then all of a sudden making a product at scale can be really tricky. You know, some people are not good at marketing. You know, they don't want to go out. And, you know, they want to spend their time making, and then they don't want to go out there and like market their projects. And um, you know, that doesn't come naturally to some people. And so, you know, there are challenges I think to this model. Um, and again, I'm really happy to talk about this. And I just want to end by saying that yeah, Kickstarter has been uh, really had um, a lot of really successful projects here in Liverpool, which is really cool to see. So Keith's project right there um, uh, was awesome. Kitty's Laundrette, um, Granby Workshop is an amazing project. Um, yeah, they said they, they make ceramics, an architectural ceramic studio based um, in Texas. Uh, swap bots. There's so many more. Just there has been. It's like a small city, but there's actually been quite a uh, a huge amount of really amazing, successful products on Kickstarter. So it's really, um, yeah, great to see that in this city. And I hope, yeah, it's had an impact. That's it for now. Thank you.